Welcome back to Plug Live Television and to Watt Barriers Balancing the Rapid Charge to Electric Vehicles. We're currently looking at the raw materials that are required for lithium-ion batteries to transition the entire world's fleet of cars across to electric propulsion, let alone one nation's. So last time we looked at lithium and cobalt and we discovered there's actually a lot more out there and a lot less required than people might think. But there are other considerations to take into account. What happens when those batteries die? How long do they last? Do they get recycled? And that's what we're going to look at today. Last time we looked at the most contentious materials in lithium-ion batteries, lithium and cobalt, and found that there are plenty of reserves of each material. But one concern that is often raised is that the batteries themselves won't last long at all and will quickly need to be replaced. On the contrary, EV batteries last a lot longer than many people may think. A prime example of this is WYSI, the 24 kWh short-range Nissan LEAF taxi from Cornwall. The 24 kWh LEAF has one of the most rudimentary battery designs on the market, and arguably wasn't designed with constant use and constant rapid charging in mind. Despite this, by the time that WYSI had clocked up 100,000 miles, it was still showing all 12 of its state-of-health bars on the dashboard, which means that the battery was in excellent condition, despite a pretty gruelling daily routine. Wizzy would go on to clock up 174,000 miles in four years as a taxi, before being sold to its new owner. Way more miles than most petrol or diesel cars do before being scrapped. Admittedly, it lost a couple of state of health bars over that time, but its new owner continued to use its original battery after the sale. And the total repairs required over all of that mileage was one ball bearing. Name one petrol or diesel car that can claim that level of reliability. So, why do EV batteries last longer than the batteries that are found in our smartphones or laptops? For starters, EVs have better battery management. The cells in the battery pack are monitored by a battery management system, or BMS. This chip monitors the voltage and temperature of the cells and the current being drawn from or applied to them, and adjusts the peak power delivery or the settings of the thermal management system, which helps to keep the cells at their optimal operating conditions. For example, if the pack starts to get hot, the cooling system is switched on, which helps to remove the heat from the battery pack quicker. The battery management system in an EV also has state of charge buffers at the top and the bottom of the cell's capacity. As such, the usable capacity of the cell is less than its actual capacity, but the SOC buffers play an important role in increasing the cell's lifespan. The upper SOC buffer helps to minimise electrolyte degradation inside the cell that happens when the cell is sitting at a high voltage for a prolonged period of time. Whilst the lower SOC buffer helps to prevent over-discharge and the irreversible damage that this causes if the car is parked up at a low SOC for several weeks. EV battery packs also have very different operating environments to consumer electronics. An EV in the UK is typically exposed to an ambient temperature range from minus 10 to plus 30 degrees C which is broadly in line with the optimum temperature range for lithium-ion cells. Conversely, a smartphone spends most of its time in your pocket, at 37 degrees C, and if it's running intensive apps, the battery temperature could easily reach 50 degrees C, which accelerates degradation. Not only this, but some smartphone battery manufacturers deliberately overcharge the battery slightly, to 4.3 volts instead of the recommended 4.2 volt cutoff, all in the name of gaining a few extra minutes runtime at the expense of increased battery degradation. The processor on a laptop can reach 90 degrees C before it starts to throttle back, and on top of this, the battery pack is exposed to a thermal gradient. Here's an example of an older style laptop battery pack, which from this angle would slot into the laptop by moving downwards on the screen. The row at the bottom of the screen therefore slides further into the laptop and sits closer to the CPU, so it therefore gets hotter and degrades quicker than the outer row of cells. My former PhD colleagues took several dead laptop battery packs apart and found that whilst the inner rows of cells were dead, the cells in the outer rows tended to be in good condition, so you could actually make a new laptop battery pack out of two dead ones. But what happens to dead EV batteries? It turns out that, thanks to their better battery management, they still have a useful second life ahead of them, and often end up being used in energy storage systems. An electric vehicle's battery pack is made up of several modules in series. Inside these modules are cells that contain the chemical components that store and deliver energy. An EV battery is defined as dead when it still has 70 to 80% of its original capacity left, which is plenty for energy storage applications. 
Additionally, grid storage involves much lower and more consistent loads than the harsh and dynamic drive cycles encountered in an EV, so the cells have a much easier second life. Packs and modules from EVs have already been repurposed to form domestic and grid-scale energy storage systems. One example is Nissan's X-Storage home energy storage system, which uses Second Life Leaf cells, has 6 kilowatt hours capacity and 6 kilowatts peak output, and despite using old cells, has a 10-year warranty. Similar systems are also in use that use BMW, Renault and Mitsubishi cells. At the grid scale, Dundee City Council's flagship EV charging hub at Princess Street features an on-site energy storage system that uses several old Renault Zoe battery packs stacked on top of each other to give 90 kilowatt hours of storage capacity and 60 kilowatts of peak power. The system is charged off of the hub's solar canopies or off of the grid. Eventually those batteries will degrade to the point that they are no longer useful for storage, but the good news is that they can and will be recycled. Companies like Lifecycle are now able to recover up to 100% of the materials from lithium-ion cells and are scaling up their operations. Lithium-ion battery recycling consultants, Circular Energy Storage, currently have 93 lithium-ion recycling firms in their database, including established firms and startups. Should all of those firms succeed in their ambitions, the global capacity to recycle lithium-ion cells will exceed the supply of end-of-life batteries by 2030. Additionally, the Faraday Institution in the UK has invested millions of pounds in the Relib project, which has brought together some of the best research groups and industry experts to further improve the lithium-ion battery recycling process. Far from being a burden, lithium-ion battery recycling can be a huge economic and industrial opportunity for a nation especially if that nation has little in the way of raw material reserves of its own. The creation of a closed-loop supply chain, provided by battery recycling, safeguards against geopolitical factors and volatile market prices. It also supplies the nation's battery manufacturers with raw materials and creates a new revenue-generating industry in the form of importing end-of-life batteries from elsewhere. As an example, let's say that the UK set up a battery recycling plant, a battery manufacturing plant and a new EV production line. End-of-life batteries from EVs and grid storage applications could be imported, potentially charging a recycling fee to do so. Those end-of-life batteries would then be recycled, and the raw materials supplied to the battery factory, which would turn them into new batteries, which generates more revenue. Some of those batteries could be exported at this stage, which again provides another revenue stream. The rest of the batteries would be sent to the EV production line, where they would be installed in new EVs, which could then be sold within the UK or exported. Either way, this would bring in further revenue for the nation's economy. It's clear that whichever nation or nations leads the way in creating a closed-loop battery supply chain stand to gain significantly from the economic benefits that it brings. Given the lucrative nature of this closed-loop supply chain, which country wouldn't want to recycle lithium-ion batteries? So, not only do lithium-ion batteries in electric vehicles last a lot longer than the lithium-ion batteries that people are used to from smartphones and laptops, but they also get used in grid storage applications afterwards, they've still got plenty of useful lifespan in them, and eventually they do get fully recycled. And not only that, but there is a huge economic opportunity for whichever nation or nations actually get in there first and build that closed-loop supply chain. There is no way that every single nation in the world is going to miss that opportunity. And I can tell you now that the UK is very much looking into this and trying to get ahead of the competition. And having realised they've lost out in actually building the batteries uh, in the first place, they're looking at ways to try and not only catch up on lost ground on the manufacturing of batteries, but key, you know, the key point is try and gain the world lead in recycling them. And the UK is not the only country in the world that is trying to gain that advantage. So there's going to be a very exciting decade's worth of activity, I reckon, to build up all of this recycling infrastructure, but it's looking very promising at the moment. That's all for now, but stay tuned for the next episode of Plug Life Television.